Height of Fashion would be the start of where I got involved. Um, she's out of Highclere, who actually won the Guineas. Uh, Height of Fashion um, was a filly that, unfortunately, I didn't ride when she was starting to win her races at two, because the day before that I was going to ride her in the York, in I think it was the Acom, and uh, I had a bit of a little fall when I smashed my head in on silk and knot and I was out for seven months so she went on and won three she was top filly she was rated top filly as a two-year-old and I never rode her and then of course the following year I started back again and we had our first ride on her at Goodwood when it was the loopy stakes and there was only four runners but unfortunately we had a shower of rain and the clerk of the course obviously hadn't cut too much grass on that top turn at Goodwood. And Devon Eyre, who was ridden by uh, Brian Rouse, and she was a champion animal who had come over from South Africa, she slipped and slid. And of course I'm falling on this great big long lanky filly, height of fashion, and she saw it sliding. And she got it right because she jumped over the top of it and landed in a bit of a heap. And then, of course, I gathered her up. And we had a, a runner in the race, Her Majesty, a, a filly called Round Tower, ridden by Ernie Johnson, who was in there especially to make the running. And she was making the running. She missed all this animal slidding all over the place. And, of course, she got away 10, 15 lengths. And, of course, the time height of fashion got going, big long stride, couldn't quicken quickly, stayed. We got there in the end and just won. A lot of people thought that um, Annie Johnson had waited on me. Well, possibly he did, but anyway, the, the right result happened. Everybody wanted uh, height of fashion to win. Not Devon Air, of course, but uh, that was the first time I rode uh, height of fashion. And then we had two fillies in the yard, swift foot, and cut loose, who on the gallops obviously were a little bit more precocious and looked a bit better than her. So she wasn't aimed at the oaks. She was thought to be too long striding and not, uh, the oaks Epsom wouldn't suit. So uh, she went elsewhere. And she, I think she was sold for a lot of money to buy, uh, Sheikh Hamdan came in and he bought her for the Queen and actually the Queen bought West Dilsley stables with the proceeds so it was a lot of money. There is a one mare out of High Clare in the sale and I went to buy her because I was looking for the blood and uh, I don't tell anybody. So Tom John noticed that I am uh, bidding. He came, he said, what you are doing? I said, I am bidding on uh, this mare. He said, uh, if you want to buy from the family, buy the best representative. And I advise you not to buy it. I said, but I, I would like to the blood. So I looked to him, I said, you think I will get height of fashion? He said, why not? Straight away. Anyhow, on August, 
next year, he tell me that they want this money, this price for the mayor. So I agree straight away. And I was in Germany. So we, get, we bought uh, the mayor. And when I came to see her, she, uh, she looked like a skeleton, very light. And uh, she, wa she bled also. We take her straight away to uh, America. And we send her twice to Northern Dansker. And after to blushing room, and after to dancing, and uh, after that, stay three times with uh, Mr. Prospector. Out of fashion, uh, it was a very good filly of the Queen's. I remember riding her work, um, with about four of us, there was Joe Mercer and a couple of other lads, and when we pulled up, after just an ordinary bit of work, Joel Mercer turned around to me and he said, that's going to be a great broodmare. And so I thought, well, I'm going to put my name down for a uh, 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 prodigy when, when it comes. We could do the pick a mare and do all the youngsters as they came through, the foals. But luckily, the first one went to Thompson Jones's. So I thought, well, that's done it. I won't have any. And then Geordie, the head lad, said to me the following year, he says, the next one's coming, do you want to do it? I says, yeah, I'll do it. I says, I'll do the family from now on. He says, right. And, and he said, it's by Northern Dancer. And I believe it was the last crop of the Northern Dancers on for Wayne. And boy, what a beautiful horse that was. The Viola line been a prodigious producer for the royal family um, and though we talk about height of fashion in fact that family goes right the way back as a producing family to Fiola. Um, Fiola as you say I mean she had been placed in two classics she then produced Hypericum. Hypericum was very interesting because um, she was second in the, the middle park to Khalid um, uh, who'd won the Coventry Stakes then, of course, she went on to the Dewhurst and proceeded to win that, the last filly to do so. So um, she was obviously a filly of exceptional ability at, at two. And then uh, at three, she comes out and wins the 1,000 guineas. But at that stage was always showing um, a sign of temperament, which to this day still comes through in the family. Um, uh, and then after uh, she retired, of course, she goes to stud and uh, produces Highlight, and then the Royal Stud's got Highclere. And it's Highclere that's in the lead, next to the inside rail. Highclere from the early leader, Biddy Girl, Mrs. Dickerwinkle 3, as they come downhill into the dip. And it's Highclere, and the chairs are out here at Newmarket. Could this be a royal winner? It's Highclere still, and Joe Mercer in the lead. But polygamy is now being produced by Pat Edery, the favourite coming strongly, racing into the final 150 yards. It's Highclere and polygamy. It's going to be a photo finish for the 1,000 guineas. That's the line. It's absolutely impossible to separate Highclere and polygamy. She was the foundation mayor for the whole of Shadwell Stud. I mean, she was incredible. I mean, there'd be massive, massive descendants of good horses and daughters who produced champions. I mean, Saria, by Mr. Press, Prospector, daughter of Hyde of Fashion, produced Ganati, and then, um, you know, so, so many others out of the mayor that we had. I always look to the trainer who deal with the family of the animal. So when we get uh, height of fashion. The first hair progeny was trained by Tom John. And Tom John said to me that is the major is the train, he trained the whole family. And uh, I didn't know him. So they were selling new market, and Tom John introduced me 
or he introduced him to me, and we met, and we sit there and we talk, and I sent the second progeny, Amphuan, to the major, and carry on the whole until he retired, he trained all the progeny of fight of fashion. I remember High Clear myself, actually, because I was a student at Sandringham at that time. Um, she was quite a feisty mare. Um, um, whenever you went into the box, there were always two of you there, just to, uh, from a safety point of view. Uh, that feistiness never really came through to height of fashion, who was actually a much more settled individual. But of course, Bustino, who was standing at the Royal Stud, um, he was a he had a lovely temperament and uh, was a very gentle horse. So um, the, uh, the 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 family going back to Fiona had that sort of that temperament. But I think you will find in a lot of very good race mares, they need to have that sort of uh, feistiness. It gives them that, uh, that, that 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 fighting spirit that we're all looking for. Well, um, I've been working in New Zealand for a while, and about four years, I guess. And I remember sitting up one night very late uh, with Jim Wallace, who ran the stud and owned the property where I was working. And he, we used to sit up and have a gin and tonic and way after work, you know, and it was great fun, Jim. And he, um, I said, um, you know, if you had a horse to send to England, who do you send it to? And he said, Major Dick Hearn. Without, you know, he knew Ian Boarding, he knew all his other trainers, he, he was very, well-traveled when he was looking for stands in Europe. And he met all these trainers and he said, I'd send one to Dick Hearn. So it, it, it flagged something up in my mind, you know, because Jim was um, a very experienced breed and bred um, very good horses in New Zealand, went to Australia and won Australia Cups and things like that. And, um, you know, he knew what he was talking about. So um, through an uncle of mine, Tim Fitzgeorge Parker, who was actually um, the racing correspondent on the Daily Mail, um, Tim thought he knew everybody, we probably did. And he got me an introduction to him at Newbury. And I met him at Newbury and one day during racing and he said, um, you can come and muck out your three and whatever. This is about 1983, so a year before he had his accident. You can come and do your three and, and uh, see how you get on. So that's when I first met him um, under the old concrete stands at Newbury Racecourse. And, uh, you know, it's a very exciting time for me because I got a job with a proper trainer. Well, the major was a true horseman. He was such a, a horseman. He came from Porlock Riding School, but in the war it, there were him, Major Pope and somebody else that was became trainers. They found some horses in Italy and they thought, oh, oh, we'll train these. And uh, Dick was the trainer. Um, Major Pope ended up being the clerk of the course. Somebody else was in charge of the tote. They, all the, the soldiers came to the race, made a race meeting, and all the soldiers came, and they were having a great time. And of course, they rode them as well. And I think the major rode a winner, they put a few hurdles up as well. And they had a good time out there, you know, sort of. They had a, I believe they had quite a few race meetings. But he came from Porlock, which was just riding proper stuff, you know, teaching people to ride the proper way. And then, he got the job in Newmarket for Major Holiday. That's his first ever job. He came from Porlock Riding School into training a whole stable of horses who, well, it must have been 50 horses. And they, and Ho Major Holiday was one of the top owners. He, he was, had all the good horses and he went straight in and Dick was a bit worried about it, but he came through and started uh, training horses 
nobody had taught him. He taught himself how to train these horses. And I remember Dick always told me the story about one of his first runners for Major Holiday. Was it was a biggish colt. He ran him, and then of course he picks up the telephone and rings the Holiday up and said, "Well, your horse, your horse ran very well. He got a bit tired. He he'd be better for the race, and next time we'll we'll see what he can do." And the reply was, "You have two thousand acres at Newmarket." Train them. Don't be just getting them ready. Train them so that they're ready. He was the strictest um, schoolmaster. Anybody could ever, it was a bit like, so it felt a bit sort of Dickensian in many ways. You know, we're going back, <laughs> you know, several years. Um, but he, he, um, he was a great disciplinarian and I think he was a great teacher. And, and that became more prevalent um, when he had his accident in a wheelchair because he, I was his right hand then, he had to teach me everything he knew, otherwise he had got no chance. And, um, but, um, you know, it was a great experience and I used to ride out and look after two or three horses and uh, it was just wonderful. That ground level experience was terrific and he had great staff and lots of them, plenty of staff and people like Brian Proctor I met and obviously Willie Carson, obviously he was a stable jockey and, you know, and it was a great team. He was an easy man to ride for because you knew your horses would run straight, you knew they were fit, so you didn't have to go sit out in the back, you just jumped out the stalls. And that was the other thing, he would put the horses through the stalls, religious, his army, re regimental, boom, boom, get them in the stalls, jump them out, in the stalls, jump them out. So he had his horses rigorously trained, you know, straight. And he was, I thought he was pretty tough on horses, but by goodness, he could get the best out of them. Well, I met him before he has got the accident. And uh, I thought he's uh, really a horseman. He, he knows what he's talking about it, about the horses. I don't talk about a lot of things about the horses, but I was saying that, you know, I'm nice to meet you. I have got the high clearance family, and he said, I know you have got fight, height of fashion. She was champion two years old, so and so. And I said, I would like to send you some. I would like to send her progeny. And he said, that is my pleasure. Only the meeting would take about five minutes. He ran very tight ship, uh, very relaxed, but if anything went wrong, uh, you could hear him. Um, and something, office, you would be taken into the office. I ended up in there a few times and it was never shouting. It was always explained. He was very good that way. He never lost his temper in front of others, but you were told, you know, in a certain way in the office that where you had gone wrong, don't do it again. And he was such a tough, but very, very fair. He would always put his arm around you if you made a mistake and help you. Brian Proctor, you know, who rode him many, many, many times. Um, it's, he was a real serious cog in the wheel as to making everything work properly, Brian. Bravest man ever seen, best second jockey there's ever been. And, uh, you know, he, he was tremendous. And you see um, his son, Tony, now with John Gosden, driving ahead lad, leading up the horses now, and there with the horses. And, is a, is a cut off the old block. Daddy was an integral part of uh, the Major's workforce, so they had a lot of very good lads there at the time, but um, he, was, he was there mainly as a, as a work rider for 28 years. Um, you say he rode some very good horses. I was remembering him telling me about Brigadier Gerard the first day he turned up to the Major's yard, and I think the Major must have been showing him around and he was in the Jeep and Brigadier Gerard actually got loose that morning. They were racing down in the Jeep to catch him. So that was one of the first uh, stories about that that I really got to hear. We must remember who backed him up was the little goddess called Sheila, his wife. She was, she ruled the roost. She was his backing and uh, anything in the stable it went wrong, in family or anything, Sheila was there 
and Sheila was the person who'd always be able to ring up a surgeon, tell you where to go, where to sort things out. She was a little goddess. She was a marvellous, strong little lady. Tiny little thing, my size, but oh, what a gorgeous woman she was. I remember when he first arrived in the yard as a yearling and he was very raw looking and uh, um, I said to many people he had little bare patches on his knees and I thought oh no he's been down on his knees at some stage you know but in actual fact he was quite weak not people will remember this but he was quite weak as a yearling and he used to get up in a funny way and very often it involved the hind legs coming up first rather like a cow and, and yeah I've never seen a horse do that before but he did it to begin with and then I suppose as he got stronger he um, that all, you know, that all stopped. Young Turpin still several lengths clear in the centre of the track now. From child of the Mr. Nashwan, in street clear of towards the far side toe tracking. Nashwan steadily cutting down Young Turpin. As they go for the line, Nashwan just gets in front of Young Turpin. Child of the Mist and Toad Sackett. Uh, he did it okay. He was obviously a horse going places, but he, he wasn't, in my eyes, a superstar at that time. Well, the Newbury Maidens, um, historically, have always been, you know, good races, and, but he put it to bed really quite quickly, and, uh, yeah, it was very exciting. And then we went to October at Ascot. He ran in a mile race there, and I remember coming up round the turn and going up the stand side because the ground was heavy, deep. He shouldn't have ran really. He was never going to be overtaxed as a two-year-old because he was a big horse and very often these big rangy two-year-olds, you know, they can go a bit weak and it'd be a shame really to have um, asked him too many questions I think. Um, so he had the two runs and that was that. They race up towards the line stretching really well and as he comes up to the line that one wins it very well indeed from Optimus second with third, Kakoa Theers. He wanted to get a race into him because he'd only had the one race. And he won 10 lengths. And I remember getting off and, and saying, Dick, he hated that. He says, he's won 10. I said, I don't care. He said, I said, he hated that ground. It wasn't for him at all. He's pretty good, you know. You know. So he went into the winter as not our best horse, because we had a horse called Prince of Dance, who dead heated in the um, Dewhurst. And it's Prince of Dance that battles on. Prince of Dance goes on, but Seelig fights back and Seelig fights more. It's another race. Prince of Dance comes again. It's a battle between these two up towards the line, and Seelig and Prince of Dance flash past the post together. Saratoga is third. We had Prince of Dance, um, you know, who was an Al rare, but they, 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 they were going to be eventually they were going to be um, group one winning horses, you know. And, um, you know, and he was sitting in with those very often. Um, you didn't have to be a genius to spot Nash one. During the winter, he threw a splint and it was a bad one. And so uh, I had to ride him out all winter in the covered ride as a third lot. And I was riding him on his own, just me and him. Trot, on trot, walking, uh, or for a long time. And, and then the others started getting into work and doing, we were still trotting and walking. Dick loved trotting his horses and, and getting them all big and strong. And he missed a lot of that. And of course it put him back. So in the spring, when we start working the horses in early March, uh, he wasn't working and um, we were, interested in Prince of Dance because he was our main man and we had worked Prince of Dance and he'd worked well and then of course um, Prince of Dance went wrong so he was on the back and of course Dick had got this big nice coat going along quietly out the back out third lot 
toodling along, just slowly trying to catch up. And of course, when Prince of Dance fell foul, as it were, uh, Dick thought, I better work this horse. Not, not with me, yet he worked him. And he thought, hmm, he's all right. Dick Hearn always thought he was, the, and as I did, I must say, we both did, I think, we, he was going to be the derby horse, always going to be the derby horse. So he was never really considered for the guineas. I mean, Al Horeb was the guineas horse, and as you say, um, he unfortunately broke blood vessels. And so, you know, um, it, was, it came along um, a little bit later that um, Sheikh Hamdan suggested to Dick Hearn, right, we've lost Al Horeb, we haven't got Al Horeb in the picture. And, um, we should maybe train Nashwan for the Guinness, and it hadn't really been considered at that stage. We were having lunch, and uh, Sheikh Maktoum said to me, How is uh, I said, Our horses, he blood. He said, What about um, Nashwan? I said, But is, uh, the, the major thing he's a mile and a half, not a mile and a quarter. He said, Tell the major to train him. If he is not good enough, uh, he don't run. So I picked the telephone and he said, he bred for a mile and a half. I said, what? Train him for the guineas and see. He said, I'm going to work this Nashwan horse, he said, on no account, and I remember his finger, no account you ask him to do anything. I just want you to feel him and let me know if he's okay. He says, but don't, whatever you do, go for him. Just go up there with the others. So I did that. I said, yeah, give me, afterwards, give me a nice feel. Yeah, if he, I wasn't excited because I hadn't asked any question. I just followed and said he was fine. Anyway, that was eight, ten days or something before the gallop. And he thought, right, we'll try him. So the, the gallop was... Uh, organised and Arnold Weinstock was supposed to come with this was going to be Prince of Dan's gallop that trial for him but he wasn't there so Arnold Weinstock came and he was watching the gallop and I believe there was four of us I was on Nash one and of course I had I didn't know what weight I was carrying, I never did, because Dick always put a lead cloth on me because I was light and his lads were heavier. So there was always a lead cloth on everything I rode. So I don't know what he had on him. There was Bob Asher, the lightweight. Brian Proctor was on the lead horse that we got from Thompson Jones's and Willie on my horse, that's one. And, the, and he had a weight. There was all, they was older than him. They were four-year-olds and he was three-year-olds. And he had a white cloth, and it weighed a ton. I put it on him. It weighed a ton. And um, Bob Asher on on this horse jumped off at the seven. All the others lads had gone home. Jumped off at the seven. And Brian Proctor on this other horse we got from Thompson Jones's jumped in after three furlongs. So there was one led him half, and the other horse led him the other half. And I was in the Land Rover with the major waiting to, to, to pick him up at the, at the end when the finish had come home. And he passed us at about a furlong from the end. And he'd only gone three furlongs with Brian. And Brian was a dot in the distance. I remember two out furlong before the Land Rover pulled him out. Go on, son. Good. So he strode away. And uh, I went up to the seven, pulled him up. There was nobody there. Absolutely clear. And it did little specks in the distance with the other three horses. So I trotted back to Proctor and I, I was quite annoyed. I said, what'd you pull up for? And I could see Proctor's face. He turned around to Dad and asked him why he pulled up. And he said, he, he said, I hadn't. He said, you should know me better than that. I wouldn't pull up on one. So, I mean, they obviously knew then how, how good the gallop was. And, how high a regard that they were going to hold Nashwan in from that day onwards. You couldn't believe it. He just ran away from it. And when we got to the bottom, Willie Carson got off and we was walking round the three, the three of us walking round, and, and um, Willie Carson said to the Major, he says, come on, let's get off before these go home. 
he says, because them phones will be burning, he says. And then when I get, I got off the horse, got <laughs> into the Land Rover with Dick and Arnold Weinstock, and he had one of those bricks, those new fashioned telephones. I said, sir, you're in the best seat. Oh, if I was you, I'd be ringing the bookmaker and using that. <laughs> And actually, I think he had about a tenner each way or 20 quid each way, and the bookmakers all went, wow, that's a big bet for him. So that was when they got, you know, a little twinkle that there was something going on. He phoned me and he said he worked brilliant, and he was 40 to 1, and now it is almost a favourite for the Guinness. <laughs> By the time he got back to the old rectory, the, the price had tumbled, and that was before anybody could get on the telephone and not a landline type telephone. So um, we were rather disappointed at the time. We were thinking, well, we could have got a bit of 33 to one, which we didn't get. But I, I decided not as the price had gone, I decided to back him for the Derby anyway. Um, got a good price for Derby and then backed him again on Derby day with money I didn't really have. But anyway, it came off luckily. I remember when we're going back to the yard in the Land Rover, the lads were cycling back to their breakfasts in the village and I thought they were just going a little bit quick in their bike. There was a bit extra momentum in their pedalling. And of course the phone box, I believe, was queuing up. <laughs> so there was no te mobile telephones in those days. And of course that, that telephone box in uh, West Dilsley, it was busy that morning. <laughs> And then when the television, it was the Newbury meeting, and when the meeting came on, the first thing, I think it was John McQuarrie, the first thing he said, I've got an important thing to say, he says, there's been an important gallop on the downs at West Hillsley. And Nashwan has done a gallop, a superb gallop, he said. And since that gallop this morning, he's been backed from 40 to 1, I think to 6 to 1, second favourite or something. And he'd, he'd finished up favourite, and it was his first run. Well, I was, I was over um, at, at Chilton at the time, and, and the word soon got about um, pretty quickly afterwards. <laughs> and, um, and then that's when the lads got back, they got back to the stable then, quick as y you thought, and, and uh, they all got on and rushed down the bookies, and well, the rest was history, you know. And, and, Bookies weren't happy, but the lads was. <laughs> the first house I ever bought was in Skoltback Estate. I put the parents in there, and that's where I stayed. And uh, Elaine, my wife, she always relates the story uh, that I'm got the Sport and Life or the Racing Post and uh, and as I got up off the settee to go and get ready to go to the races and uh, I'm reputed to have said I've waited all winter for this I knew that I was going to the races to do something special. I mean I have to say that um, I remember um, I remember Dick Hearn it's, it's another thing that sort of you know the knowledge you know his, his action suggested that you know he shouldn't really be held up in any way whatsoever because he had a big stride, much bigger stride. He watched the film, he had a much bigger stride than any other horse in the race and he had to use it. And one thing Dick Hearn said to Willie when, before he went out, let him use his stride. He wasn't telling me to be second, third, hold up, be in front. Let him use his stride. It's so important, those horses that, you know, an action like that, if you interrupt them, they lose their momentum. So it was important. and. Um, it came off for that reason, and he, and he won well going away. They're inside the final furlong, and Nashwan just has it from Dane Hill, export finishing strongly, but Nashwan quickens again inside the final furlong, and Nashwan wins from export Dane Hill. Guinea's day, when I jumped off the horse, I remember I'd, I half tried a Frankie Dittori, not quite, but and I landed on one of the shakes. I landed on top of him because we were absolutely, the crowd were going mad. I've never had a reception like it. The crowd were going mad because this horse had won the guineas. And it wasn't just the horse winning the guineas. It was a situation and Dick Hearn being told to leave and 
There was all this sort of two sides, people for, people against. And it all came out coming into that women's enclosure at Newmarket where all the people who were at Forum just erupted. It was a marvellous, I can still hear it in my ears, all the lovely things that were being said. And we got three cheers for Dick Hearn from the public. How about that? That doesn't happen very often. But that was a marvellous day for the whole team, you know. Um, I remember when um, uh, Dick Hearn was on his way home and the staff um, got out um, and made banners and all sorts of things. And when um, Dick came back to the old rectory, it was, you know, it was, it was lots of uh, balloons and all sorts of things you know, to welcome the trainer and the finest hour. It was his finest hour, really, I suppose, because, you know, coming back from his terrible hunting accident, it was a huge thing. And thanks for the loyal support of Sheikh Hamdan, you know, stuck with him and, you know, kept the whole thing going, really. Uh, it was a wonderful day. It was quite special and I think I could see a tear in that man's eye that day. Um, tough, the tough major. Uh, it was a very, very special day. You know, it was one of those sort of days that hurts you here. You know, it's there, it never leave. That day. I mean, he looked marvellous on Derby Day, I'll never forget it. And that was, oh, I mean, it, was, it just looked, he shone. I think the best performance to me is the Derby. I will tell you something. Any new owner, they thought that the classic is very easy. As soon as you know that it is how difficult it is, just one week, two days, he get wrong or, you know, or maybe he didn't do the distant, or maybe he went more distant. So it is very difficult. The classic is very difficult. But before you thought it is easy. I think when anyone sets out um, owning and breeding racehorses, um, their ultimate objective is to, to win the derby. Well, as a jockey, if you're riding in the derby, you don't ride a horse in the derby and think to yourself, he doesn't stay, you won't win. You've got to ride him, thinking that he stays a mile and a half. Dick Hearn came up, because he used to come up every December. When he came to stud, he was telling me the story of him. He said, this horse, because he's nearly 17 hands, he said he could win up the side of a wall, a brick wall. He was that balanced. This action was, was the key. He had beautiful action. And um, when you look back on the derby, Willie always had him in a very good position. You know, he was, he was sitting far enough forward, but he, he had the option of going outside if he had to. He wasn't going to get down that rail and compromise his action. Bearing in mind, going back to the Guineas, when Dick Hearn said, let him use his stride. And, it, and Willie was, you know, he, he rode that sort of race in the derby for me. I actually kicked for home. I think it was about two and a half out. And, um, in the back of my head I might have been thinking that he doesn't stay but uh, I kicked because there was one horse in the race I had to beat it was my big danger was Kakoethes Rebel Starkey I had him there and I could just see the, the signs of Rebel just moving and uh, that was telling me oh 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 he's not going to find a lot more so let's kill him so that's when I kicked. When I saw Greville do that, I thought, get him beat. Go, go, get him beat. Nash one now, pushed along in four, but Greville Starkey goes for home with three furlongs to go in the Ever Ready Derby. Kako Ethys pressed on the outside of Bayo Daniski, but here comes Nash one with a good looking spick. Torjun back in four. They race down towards the two furlong marker, and the duel we expected is materialising. And it's Nash one that goes on. It's Nash one and Willie Carson, and length ahead of Kako Ethys and Greville Starkey. A furlong and a half to go in the derby, and Nash one has it. Kako Ethys in second place. 
The back in third is Terry Moore, but inside the final third off, Nash Webb provides an electrifying burst of speed. It's a one-horse race. Willie Carson in the drive position. Nash Webb wins it easily. At the line, Nash Webb is the winner. Terry Moore came for him in second category if he's third. goes down in folklore in, in West Hillsley. I mean, I think there's a bench up the pub there with Nash one on it. And I remember being at the Derby and thinking, what a mover he was. He was a lovely, he was a big chestnut horse. Do you know, I always think of David Ellsworth, because David Ellsworth always loved a big horse, flashy horse. And he was, he wasn't flashy because he was that sort of um, liver chestnut, but what a mover he was. He was an absolute, you know, and I always remember seeing Willie Carson go into post and they used to go round and then across the road in them days. And I saw him come round there and he just handled it round that bend so well. And I thought, well, I would, like I say, and it was, he was the most impressive horse I had seen. I was standing next to Guy Harwood when Nash one went down to a start. We were standing next to each other. And um, after the race, and he said to me, I knew we would beat when I saw your horse, horse go to the start. I never got to the winner's enclosures. I was too busy chasing the bookmakers. And, and who actually, one or two of them had cleared off actually. They couldn't pay out. I mean, not just me, but several other people, you know. So <laughs> in those days, I was probably a bit reckless and I thought, well, what, this horse will never get beat. I just couldn't see this horse getting beat. It was, it was an extraordinary feeling actually. And then, you know, I remember afterwards, I think um, being under the old stand, um, a bottle of champagne or two was opened then. And, probably got a bit carried away at that stage. But oh, it's an incredible feeling, you know, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful day. It was so important for West Hillsley, so important for Dick Hearn. Put him way back on the map again, you know, and he, we, we were sort of, you know, after his accident, things were difficult and he didn't have champions. But at last, at last he got another one and there'd be more to follow. Huge, huge passion that Hamdan and the brothers have for racing. Um, they're non-flinching, actually. They, they, you know, every stud, every owner, every sort of jockey, they, you know, we all have bad seasons and things when don't go right. And an amazing thing about Sheikh Mohammed and Sheikh Hamdan and, and his brothers is that they came back time and time again. They loved it. And, and thankfully, they were rewarded in some way getting a champion like Nash won. This is the first derby win the family had had. Nash won, basically, he won the derby, he was a mile and a half. He never stayed a mile and a half. He was a mile and a quarter horse. Dick Hearn love the staying races, you know. But I suppose, you know, you think about this horse, I and mean, potentially he was a top-class stallion in the making. And a mile and a quarter race, uh, you know, in between was quite a, a valuable thing to do, you know. You know, he, all right, he's won the guineas, but let's not try and make him into a sort of out-and-out -out stayer. The race was reputed to be a race of the century with warning, Indian skimmer, they were superstars, four-year-olds. We've got the Derby winner, the three-year-old. The Derby winner always has a hard time beating the four-year-olds in the Eclipse. Little Musy strides the orders as usual, mile and a quarter, and sand down. Ground was good, and uh, we got a pacemaker of Henry Cecil's with Nigel Day riding, opening verse. I don't know it's something to do with his immaturity, but he got quite lazy in his work at home, Nash one, and we did have several trips away, not between the Guineas and the Derby, but later on, we'd have one or two trips away um, to race courses and things for, for gallops. I think, you know, he, he, he's, I don't know, it, it, just to keep his brain sharp, you know. So I hadn't taken a lot of notice beforehand about opening verse. I'm just thinking he's the pacemaker, he's 200 to one. And um, so the race is going on in this opening verse. Nice pace, keeps. And I'm just letting my horse stroke in, in his time. And uh, got these two behind me. And I'm trying, you know, 
wing mirrors, trying to look, you know, who's where, who, where everybody is. They've gone over a quarter of a mile already, and it's Greensmith leading by half a length with opening verse on the inside of him, a gap then of two lengths to Spring Hay, who shows in third. A length behind that is the powerful Nash one in four, warning settled five, and Indian skimmer tucked away in last place. So when we get to the turn, this opening verse had opened up quite a bit of distance. I thought, he's going too fast because Nashwan, he, I'm just letting him just use his ordinary stride and uh, got into the straight. And this opening verse was, well, he's 20 lengths in front. Nobody's coming. Opening verse in front as they come down towards the three. But here comes Nash one through in the blue. Under three to race. An opening verse clear of Nash one and Indian skimmer. And warning who, when he goes past the two far on marker, will be in unknown territory. And uh, I thought, well, I, well, how good is it? How good is it? it you know, it's all going in here. And I, I can't, I'm trying to go through my mind. How good is that animal? When is he going to stop? He's got to stop going this pace, but oof, that's a long way in front. So, panic button. I had to hit the panic button. And of course, I gave Nash one a dig in the ribs, and off we went. And of course, full, full throttle. And I picked him up about the furlong marker, a uh, furlong and a half out. And of course, I'm in front too soon. hundred yards before the, the line, Nashwan cut out. You know, you'd had three Group 1 races, a rush preparation to get there, so it was quite obvious that um, he, he'd had a hard time. It was a little bit of a jockey error on my part to have done what I did, because I did panic. I hit the full throw. I should have just let him quicken up slowly, but I did that that opening verse was far too far in front. Well, actually, it is uh, Raven Pat. That, that horse, uh, Henry Cecil, you know, he let him to go. And Willie, he keep with the uh, Indian skimmer to wait for her. And he recognized that he was about 25, 30 length behind him. So he kicked on. So from the turn to the end, he should when he passed him, he should slow down, but he keep pushing him until the line. He went by five length, but he, he get really tired after that. So I was a bit gloom after the race instead of being euphoric, because the way that Nashwan's head was down, he was tired coming in, and we had a discussion maybe the next day. I said, you need to give him a holiday. No, I'm going for the King George. That day, I was in Dubai, and uh, a friend of mine phoned me when they were in the paddock, and he said, Nashwan looked very light. He needs a bit of a rest. If you want for the Arctic Trium, you're going to have to possibly wait. And then Dick, the trainer that he was, he said, no, I've got to go for the King George. I don't know if Sheikh Hamdan was pushing him to go for it or not, but um, he said, I'll give him a holiday. I said, oh, good. So that was the end of the comp. So I'm down to ride him a week or 10 days before the King George. I said, you're working that horse? Yes, he's had his holiday. <laughs> Two days. 
he left them in for two days. <laughs> because he was funny in boxers, we left the stables here at dinner time. Dick got a, a police escort for the horse box because he wanted to get there as late as possible because he didn't want to put them in the stable. Come off the horse box, didn't go down to the stables, went into the big car park at the side of the stables, the entrance to, to where the um, parade ring is, walked round, there's a little circle there, we walked round there for oh, an hour or more. The horse was walked around the, the stable yard, never went into a box because he's, he was a worrier. Um, but a worry in a good way. He, he wasn't easy. He wasn't an instance where Dick Hearn was such a great trainer. He knew how to deal with things. Then took it into the race course, tacked him up, ran in the race, won the race, back, washed him down, back on the horse box. It was back here, but they were still racing at Asker. We had a pacemaker in the King George. Richard Hill was riding him. And I said, look, the best thing for us to do is I am on the fastest horse in the race. If we make the race into a sprint, I'll win. I said, if we go flat out over a mile and a half, I won't win. So everybody, other jockeys, everybody think that we've got the pacemaker because it's long stride, fast. So Richard Hill won the race. He won the King George because he jumped out, pulled us all up, we went steady, steady, and I went when I had to. And that's it, they're under starter's orders, and they're away. And Sheriff Star just misses the break as Polly Moss goes on. Polly Moss goes straight on into the lead now. From on the outside, top class, Carol House comes next. Then Nashwan, Kakarithis, and Tissera. Willie Carson just uh, checks uh, Nashwan a little there, and Sheriff Star's the back marker. Willie Carson, he done his best to win that day. He keep uh, niggling him, you know, and uh, he beat the cat, yeah, because he outstayed him in the mile and a half. Otherwise, that one, you know, at his 300 yards, he put his head in the front. But Willie, he keep niggling him, pushing him, pushing him, until, you know, he outstayed him. And that is the reason that Kakoites was only a neck behind Nashman in the King George because it was a false run race. I think it's one of my biggest triumphs to get other jockeys to believe that we were going to go flat out. We got away with it in the King George, but he was coming to the end of his tether and Kakoites gave him a hard race that day. And uh, I don't think Willie had an awful lot left. I think he was, you know, he was flat out. And, um, you know, that was it potentially. You know, we didn't know that after a break he wouldn't come back the same, but, you know, he'd, what, he'd done everything anyway, hadn't he? I mean, that was as much as he could have possibly hoped for in any race horse he'd, to win those four races like he did. It was an outstanding achievement and it's never been repeated and may never be. I knew that the horse had passed his best. He had given far, you know, he'd given tremendous. No horse has ever done it. You know, a rush preparation to start with. And then Guineas, Derby, Eclipse, King George. All within, what, for, was that three months? That is something, you know, that is asking too much. But we did it and he's just a marvellous, marvellous horse. And he won two mile and a half races, he never stayed mile and a half. Michael Tanner, he did the timings and said he could have won the six furlong sprint at Royal Ascot 
with that time that he did in the last six furlongs of the King George. He could have won a Group 1 six furlong race. That's how fast he was. In the Neil, Pat Edry told me afterwards, he said, your horse was making lots and lots of noises when I went past. He said he was gardening and making all spluttering noises, which I hadn't heard. So obviously there was something going on inside, bleeding or something. Um, and I would, I blame myself because I might have caused that sort of thing to start when I burst them in the eclipse. I think we over, we got the elastic band that a little bit too far. Amazing, isn't it? His run in the, in the pre -nail, um was obviously disappointing because, you know, he had to win that really to go on and win the arc and he wasn't the same horse. And, you know, that was it basically. But a tremendous career, wasn't it? I mean, a wonderful career. And to win those, those four races up close, you know, is stunning and made him as a stallion. I look at it this way. Nash One ran over seven furlongs as a two-year-old. Came out as a, as a three-year-old, classic racers, group one. Ran a mile, 2,000 guineas. Won in the fastest clocked time then went to a mile and a half, won the derby very easily. Then went back to a mile and a quarter, ran and won the eclipse very easily. Then went back to a mile and a half and won the King George and Queen Elizabeth States. All top class racers, top class company. Never ran the same trip twice, like a lot of these good horses. Mile and a half, mile and a half, mile and a half, mile, 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 mile. He did it the hard way. And that's that's why I thought he was a super horse. For me, he was a super horse. But he was never rated up there with the super horses, but uh, them super horses did do what he did. To us and to most other people, he was the champion and uh, should have been rated accordingly. But um, anyway. There we go. It's lovely for us because we've got Poet's Word, who actually is out of a, uh, out of a Nash one mare, so the family connection continues. He's famous round here. All the old boys in the village, JV and that, they still talk about him to this day. All the horses over the last 30 years, whatever they do, they're together. It's a routine with stallions. So whenever we covered, we'd all turn the horses out and we'd wait, literally, for Nash one to be let loose. And we'd all stand there because he blew you away with it. He's just floated over the ground. It was poetry in motion. He really was. Love it was. Dad would have summed him up as, as the best in the world at the time, which he was. He was a stunning horse from a stunning family, and you know, you never take that away from his achievements away from him. He was brilliant. He just excited to, to go and ride a horse of that quality and that stature. Marvellous horse. To me, he's. Uh... You know, very close to me.